I'm starting. Good evening, one and all, respected teachers, seniors, colleagues, and friends. On behalf of ISA National, I welcome you all to yet another ISA online PG classes, which has been running uninterruptedly since last more than one and a half years. In today's session, we have again very important topics to discuss. Children with congenital heart disease for non-cardiac surgeries. Present the topic, we have two postgraduate trainees from the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center, Kochi. And to moderate the session, we have Professor Lakshmi Kumar. But before we welcome ma'am, I would like to welcome today's moderator of the presentation. I welcome Dr. Ira Dhawan. She is a DM cardiac anesthesi anesthesiologist, currently working as assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care at PGI Chandigarh. Her key achievements include, she is a gold medalist in MD anesthesia. She has, been, she has done her DM cardiac anesthesia from AIMS New Delhi. She has been awarded with diplomat in NBA from the National Board of Echocardiography. She is a BLS and ACLS instructor. Under her belt, she has 19 publications with 275 citations and area of interest are cardiac anesthesia, AAVA, trauma, BLS, and ACLS. I welcome you, Dr. Ira. May I request you to kindly inter introduce and welcome Professor Lakshmi Kumar, madam. Thank you, Dr. Ankur, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, now it's a privilege to have with us Dr. Lakshmi Kumar. Uh, Ma'am is currently serving as the professor and head of Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. She has done her honorary fellowship in pediatric anesthesia conferred by the uh, IAPA. She's leading the transplant anesthesia unit at Ames uh, Kochi and has been facilitated for being part of over 1,000 liver transplants over 15 years. Ma'am is also heading the Pediatric Anesthesia Fellowship at Amrita Institute. And also she's the editor, associate editor of Pediatric Anesthesia Journal, section editor and reviewer of uh, JOACP, reviewer of the Indian Journal of Anesthesia, trainer for pediatric perioperative life support organized by the uh, Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesia and uh, conducted by the IAPA. And Mama 16 international, 75 national, and five chapters in various books to her name. We welcome you, ma'am, and I request you to please introduce the speakers for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dhawan. Uh, it's actually my privilege to see my postgraduate students come forward to present a challenging topic. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Rachita Naik and Dr. Kritika Shri. And today we are actually dealing with two cases of congenital heart disease presenting for non-cardiac surgery. Uh, I would now request Dr. Kritika to lead the first presentation where she would be speaking about a child with a cyanotic congenital heart disease presenting for dental extraction. Over to you, Kritika. Yes, ma'am. Uh, go on. Uh, good evening, everyone. The first case, uh, my patient is a four-year-old boy with a cardiac disease who came with his mother with a complaint of multiple dental caries and was planned for a dental rehabilitation procedure, which involves tooth extraction and fillings prior to a corrective surgery that was planned after two to three weeks. On further questioning, the mother gave an history that he was a second-born child to a non-consanguineous marriage born at full term, 37 weeks of gestational age, by a normal vaginal delivery, child weighed around 3.2 kgs at birth and cried immediately after birth. There is no history of neonatal ICU sleep. And a few days after the birth, the mother noticed that the child turns blue while feeding and took her to a primary hospital where an echo was done and was said to have a congenital heart disease and was referred to a tertiary center. 
uh, there as a corrective surgery is not possible at that time the child who underwent a surgery to improve oxygenation at around 18 months of age after surgery the mother noticed that the frequency of the bluish discoloration has reduced but still the child turns blue while playing and crying that is relieved by squatting it happens one to two times a month and last episode was around 10 10 days back no history of any sudden uh, loss of consciousness headache or seizures no history of respiratory tract infection fever joint pain or swelling no history of breathlessness but uh, the mother says that the child takes a deep breath during the episodes of discoloration no history of hospitalization subsequently uh, no developmental delay and immunized till age medicational history the child is on tab propanolol 5 mg tds tab aspirin 75 mg od and iron supplementation no history of allergy and no similar illness in the family on general examination the child does not appear to be syndromic ear nose and faces are normal weight around 10, 20 kg moderately nourished central and peripheral cyanosis present uh, noted in the tips of finger nose uh, and the tongue clubbing of all digits present there is no pallor pedal edema icterus or lymphadenopathy vitals the child is afebrile has a heart rate of 110 per minute regular rhythm equal in all four limbs bp was 80 by 40 mm hg in the right upper limb in sitting position respiratory rate of 20 per minute abdominal thoracic and the saturation was 86 percent on room air in the right upper limb airway examination mouth opening two finger breath malampetti grade 2 dental caries noted and no loose tooth, theramental distance to finger breath, and neck movements were adequate. So going to systemic examination, CVS on inspection, chest wall appears normal, moves equally with respiration, no visible pulsation, a scar noted in the right thorax in the fourth intercostal space, and JVP normal. Palpation, epical impulse felt in the left fifth intercostal space, one centimeter medial to the midclavicular line. There is no thrill or parasternal heat. On auscultation, S1, S2 heard. Ejection systolic murmur is heard in the left parasternal edge. Uh, and a soft continuous murmur in the right sternal edge near the clavicular head. Respiratory system, bilateral normal vesicular breath sounds in all areas. No added sounds. And other systemic examinations were normal. Uh, so to summarize, um, my patient is a four-year-old child with a cyanotic congenital heart disease, palliated at 18 months of age, presenting for a dental rehabilitation prior to a corrective surgery. Thank you, Kritika, for a crisp summary. So um, um, can you just enumerate why you think it is a congenital cyanotic heart disease and what is the palliation that you think has happened? What is the most probable cyanotic congenital heart disease do you think this, this child is having? Um, since the child has a history of bluish discoloration uh, during episodes of crying and playing, it is probably a cyanotic congenital heart disease. And the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease is tetralogy of palate. What do you think the palliation is done? Why is the palliation done? And why do you think a corrective surgery was not done initially? Uh, palliative surgery is done in children for whom a corrective surgery cannot be done just to improve the oxygenation in conditions like where there is an inadequate size of the pulmonary artery. So um, probably a modified Blalock toxic shunt was done. Uh, it involves uh, a synthetic graft being placed between the subclavian artery and the ipsilateral pulmonary artery so that blood from the systemic circulation oxygenated blood reaches the pulmonary blood flow to improve good. the oxygenation for it good so how would you classify congenital heart disease and can you further subclassify the cyanotic since you're talking about a cyanotic child so congenital heart disease are classified as cyanotic and acyanotic. Uh, so I'm talking about cyanotic heart disease. They are further classified based on the pulmonary blood flow into uh, reduced pulmonary blood flow, those with increased pulmonary blood flow, and those with pulmonary artery hypertension. 
uh, those with pu reduced pulmonary blood flow or tetralogy of phallet and its variants, uh, single ventricular physiology with the pulmonary stenosis and a severe pulmonary stenosis with the right to left shunt of the atrial level. And those with increased pulmonary blood flow or those with single ventricular physiology lesion with no pulmonary stenosis, truncus arteriosus and total anomalous pul pulmonary venous communication. And those with PAH or any cardiac defect that eventually turns into an Eisenmenger physiology due to raised pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, pulmonary yeah. pressure. So you have a four-year-old child who has been diagnosed with a proper tetralogy whose pulmonary arteries were probably small, hence a primary corrective surgery at a younger age was deferred. And in order to improve the oxygenation at 18 months, a child has undergone, let's say, a right-sided uh, uh, a blaloctosic shunt, which has given a partial palliation, but is still uncorrected. At this point, perhaps an echo has been done, which has shown that there is an improvement in the size of the pulmonary artery, making surgery possible, right? So the child is coming for a corrective surgery. Now, let's look at the TOF and can you classify what are the components of the TOF so that we can deal about the anesthetic implications in child with the tetralogy? Uh, TOF has four components. It is a uh, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction uh, causing a right ventricular hypertrophy and there is a ventricular septal defect the, and an overriding iota. Right. So, um, uh, uh, supposing you have this child who has a tetralogy, right? So, in a tetralogy, basically, situation is that the blood flows from the left to the right but cannot get oxygenated, correct? And you're doing a shunt to partially allow blood to flow into the pulmonary artery to provide oxygenation. So this child has had a BT shunt. Let any child who's had a palliation with a BT shunt coming for non-cardiac surgery, what would your anesthetic concerns be? Uh, you so BT treatment that this child was, and why do you think the child is on the medications that you just described? Uh, so a BT shunt is usually done in smaller children at a younger age. So as the child grows, the size of the shunt may be inadequate to maintain the flow. So when they come for a sur uh, any non-cardiac surgery later, uh, you should make sure that the flow in the shunt is maintained. So in case of any non-cardiac surgery involving uh, raised IAP like laparoscopic surgeries, uh, there may be raised IAP that may cause an shunt block and complications. Right. So you're very concerned about maintaining the patency of the shunt which is maintained by antiplatelets and anti perhaps by adequate hydration at all points in time. Right. So let's say you have this four-year-old with a tetralogy palliated with a BT shunt pending a corrective surgery a few weeks from now, presenting for a dental rehabilitation as a pre-op workup or preparation for a corrective cardiac surgery. So you're asked to see the patient. What all investigations would you ask for? How would you know that this child is properly prepared for a corrective surgery? So preoperatively, I make sure I get a proper history and I see the old medical records to see any intervention has been done and was there any complications after the procedure. And going to blood investigation, I ask for a complete blood count where the hemoglobin may be elevated, there may be polycythemia to compensate for the chronic hypoxia and a WBC to rule out any active respiratory tract infection. And as a routine uh, in our institute, we do a coagulation PTINR and electrolytes. And for so renal function... Perturbed if you had a prothrombin time report of about, say, 19 seconds against a control of 12, you just sent a prothrombin time and the control value is 12 and you get a value of 19 and an INR of 1.5. Would that worry you? What would you do? Uh, we ask for a corrected PTINR because it may be a... What is a, what is a corrected PTINR? Um, it may be a spurious value that occurs due to the polycythemia. So, so we ask for... Surgery it. can result in lesser amounts of plasma being taken for testing. Therefore, you need to do what is called a corrected uh, prothrombin time, which will involve larger volumes of blood, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, any other investigations? You said blood investigations. Anything else? Uh, then I no? ask for an ECG, electrocardiogram. And uh, in patients with tetralogy of phallic, there may be a uh, 
features of right ventricular hypertrophy. In pediatric children, there may be right axis deviation and tall R waves in V1. Right. So you don't rely on the voltage STs criteria, voltage that you have, criteria. but you do look for a tall R in the anterior chest leads, which could uh, uh, indicate that there is a right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay. Besides an ECG, what else would you do for this child as a pre uh, Then I can, uh, I'll ask for a chest x-ray. And um, what are chest the findings on a chest x-ray in a child with tetralogy? Uh, there may be pulmonary oligemia due to reduced pulmonary blood flow. And okay, uh, the cardiac correct. shadow, uh, it's a boot-shaped boot heart. And that is Why due is to the, the pulmonary hypoplasia. Yeah, yeah. The Can you put a pointer actually show where the hypoplasia is? Probably not, right? Okay, okay, sorry. Okay. This patient. Pulmonary hypoplasia. Uh, therefore, the pulmonary bay is uh, flattened. Then? And uh, right ventricular displacement causing the boot shape. Lifting up of the heart. Okay. And pulmonary oligemia. Oligemia. Uh, uh, so, you do an ECG. You ask for a chest X-ray. You, of course, would look at the old medical records of BT shunt and any problems after the shunt. Right? Any other investigation, the most crucial, which we all ask for in a child uh, with cardiac disorders? If there is any echocardiogram done within six month duration, we can look at that echo or we ask for a new echo. Right. For this patient, the echo showed a dilated and hypertrophied uh, right ventricle, large non-restrictive VSD with aortic override, bidirectional shunt, AV normal, severe valvular and subvalvular pulmonary stenosis, normal biventricular function, and uh, right pulmonary artery at BT shunt insertion 6 mm. And there is no PDA and no collateral. Right. So essentially, it shows the whatever the components of the TOF that you mentioned, it shows that a shunt has been done and there is a narrowing there. And that is what probably the surgeon was looking at before he did a corrective surgery. Okay, you've got all this and you have the patient and you're posted in this OT, uh, dental OT where you have to give anesthesia for the cyanotic child through a dental extraction. Please tell me how you would uh, do a pre-op evaluation, how you would uh, give a pre-medication if any and manage the conduct of anesthesia. Tell me all that you'd like to do while planning anesthesia for this child. So I go see the patient the day before the surgery, maintain a rapport, and I ask for the uh, detailed history. And then uh, I ask to continue all the pre-medication that the patient is already on, like the antiplatelets and the beta blockers should be continued. They are medications, right? Not pre-medications. Yeah, the medication that the patient is already on, the beta blockers and the antiplatelets should be continued. Why do you think the child is on beta blockers? Um, any tachycardia will worsen the right ventricular auto tract obstruction. Right. So there's a component of right ventricular outflow which may be relieved by beta blockade, right? Beta blockers. Not in a valvular, but in a subvalvular pathology. Okay. And why do you think the child is getting iron supplements? Uh, there may be a relative iron deficiency due to the polycythemia. So okay. they will be on. Right. So uh, you would you said you would continue all the medications. You need to check with a dental surgeon whether they are comfortable with aspirin, right? Some of them could be finicky about bleeding after an extraction, right? If that is so, you may have to temporarily stop for the shortest duration so that you don't allow any shunt blockage, which can be very catastrophic. So you see a PSE, what will you tell the mo <coughs> mother? <clears throat> mother is very worried that the child would not eat until evening of the next day. How would you reassure uh, the mother and how would you instruct N her? Uh, NPO orders is six hours for solids and two hours for clear liquids. Uh, and since for these patients, hydration is an important uh, point, we make sure that two hours prior to surgery, the child is given some clear liquid orally. And uh, if possible, to place an IV cannula preoperatively. So and liquids are used at our institute? Because the mother may not understand if you say clear liquid. So can you clarify that? Uh, it can be a clear, clear water or uh, tender coconut water or um, a Tropicana, a tropicana juice, juice, apple juice. Yeah. 
and apple juice, yeah uh, apple pulpless. juice yeah without any pulp yeah but pulpless clear juice only few juices will fit your uh, requirements correct right so you tell her and when you are taking the child you need to ask the mother again has she given all the medications did the child refuse or throw up and did the child drink the liquid or not so that will give you an idea of its child's hydration status when you take the child okay so you received the child in the receiving area the mother says that she did get a, a tetra pack of apple juice half of which the child has sipped till 6 o'clock it's now 8 o'clock in the morning uh, tell me how you would keep the ot ready how you would take the child inside he's a 4 year old child who's going to probably flail his arms if he didn't like you how would you premedicate or separate this child and take him to the or uh, if the child has an iv cannula i would premedicate with an iv ketamine 1 mg per kg and a like a along with glycoperlate 5 mg per kg so why uh, um, i agree with your choice of uh, premedication but can you specify how ketamine is ideal for this child uh, it maintains the svr and does not uh, call a fall in svr so the pulmonary blood circulatory flow is maintained with ketamine on the contrary it does not any fall in svr could cause a more deoxygenated more. blood to enter the systemic circulation which is what you prevent besides ketamine does not really affect respiration you can very comfortably give like in 25 years and yet to see a child having a respiratory problem after 1 mg per kg ketamine so if you have an iv line you definitely i would definitely give ketamine of course taking air to avoid air bubbles right while giving yes. any yeah. other things that you would like to give for a child with a congenital heart disease coming for a non cardiac surgery any medication that you'd be worried about infection uh for infective cardiac prophylaxis um, and antibiotic should be given 30 minutes to 60 hours prior to surgery so, so if an iv line is So for giving uh, infective endocarditis prophylaxis which are the patients in whom you would like to give an iv prophylaxis and the next you can tell me which would be the choice of your antibiotic so in patients with a congenital heart disease an unrepaired cyanotic heart disease including a palliative shunt or condyles and which or a complete child fits in is that unrepaired cyanotic heart disease with a palliative shunt palliative shunt okay other or indications are other indications are a completely repaired congenital heart disease with a prosthetic material or device whether placed by surgery or catheter intervention during the first 6 months of the procedure and uh, repaired congenital heart disease with residual defects at the site or adjacent to the site of a prosthetic patch other indications are those with cardiac under her cardiac patient those with prostate cardiac valves and history of previous infective endocarditis infective endocarditis and the drugs is my uh, voice sorry, is my ma- voice or or is there some difficulty hearing me kritika yeah, no ma'am it's now fine i can hear you. you it's fine uh, from your end it's from my end you're saying kritika's voice is tailing off it's fine okay. it's fine i'm not As hearing you okay thank you so go on kritika so infective endocarditis prophylaxis for this child dental surgeon any surgeon actually likes to push in an antibiotic etali sixtali during the time he takes a patient for surgery so let's say our uh, dental surgeon has also primed his patient with a second generation cephalosporin iv the nurse has put an iv and the child is also getting a replacement of isolite p at about 60 ml per hour so would you want to give additional antibiotic or is the same antibiotic acceptable for ie uh, prophylaxis uh second generation cephalosporin uh, that would be enough no? right so don't, don't overdo antibiotic you know when you're giving a child a cephalosporin or cefiroxime don't go back and say amoxicillin or ampicillin because the guidelines for ie prophylaxis are indicated that so hand indicator but you yes i would give an ie prophylaxis probably half an hour before surgery and maybe a second dose 6 hours later 
six. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, you've given the key to me. Please explain how you would induce and manage anesthesia for a dental extraction. What are your concern? What are your goals? And how would you manage any troubleshooting? So what are your so my plan I can try with ketamine then explain the process of anesthesia induction uh, so my plan of anesthesia with will be a general anesthesia with a, or a nasal endotracheal tube and a posterior pressure ventilation so i prefer an iv induction for this kit since um, an inhalational will be a slower process since there is reduced pulmonary inhalation slower in a child with tetralogy uh, the pulmonary blood flow is reduced in patients with TOF. So we prefer an IV induction over an inhalational induction. So I attach the pre-standard monitors and I start with IV ketamine 1 to 1.5 mg per kg, uh, midazolam 0.03 mg per kg, uh, fentanyl 3 mics per kg, and uh, muscle relaxation cetracurium 0.51 0.15 mg per kg and um, after three minutes i make sure um, i give oxymetazolin drops in bilateral nose and find out which airway is patent and i use a five size cuffed nasal eye RA tube uh, and i apply jelly all over the tube and uh, without any much response i'll secure the airway and uh, after a uh, after the tube is entered, make sure bilateral air entries are equal. So what are and your endpoints before you give the cisatracurium? You've given 1 mg per kg ketamine at separation. And you said you will give 1.5 mg per kg. Are you uh, quite sure that the child is going to get induced with that dose of ketamine? You may supplement, right? It, it may work. It may not work. Correct? So you just yes, need to that once you find that the child is under as judged by that's a difficult question right mm. loss of verbal response i'm not sure which one but you really need to make sure that the child is under before you can go on to give that cisatricurium okay you use a what size tube did you say five cuffed five cuffed you uh, make sure that there's no spur in the nose as you introduce the tube yes and I maintain the anesthesia with 50% uh, uh, of oxygen uh, and sevoflurane, um, target MAC of around 0. 0.7 to 1. What saturation would you target? This child has a preoperative saturation of 86. So intraoperatively, what kind of saturations are we looking at? Um, between 80 to 86 is... Yeah, so around 85, 90% is all that you need. You do not have to target a... 100% saturation, you may not even be able to achieve it. Okay, right. So 50% oxygen air with SIBO and uh, okay, and you fixed your uh, preformed uh, tube at the appropriate. So uh, what kind of fluid management would you like to give for this child during surgery? Um, if the child is kept on NPO, uh, balance all solution, according to holiday cigar formula, for this kid, around what 60 ml per NPO? What, what are you trying to say by if he's kept NPO? Uh, if the child has not given anything orally to us prior to surgery, it means a prolonged... Uh, uh, the child, child has been fasting for a prolonged period. It's say that he had so, an IV line, 60 ml per hour of ice light P was being given, right? Yeah, yes. Then uh, maintenance fluid of around uh, balance all solution of around 60 ml per hour, I'll be giving. And 60 ml per hour. So if if you were asked to err uh, onto either a side of liberal or to be cautious, which would be your fluid strategy for this child? A liberal fluid strategy. We have to maintain adequate preload to maintain the di dilated RVO, right ventricular of your tract. Preload to prevent. Okay. So you are giving uh, a good fluid for this child. You've given additional opioid to ma make sure that the child is reasonably pain free during this procedure and an adequate uh, depth to ensure that he's not responsive to any painful stimulus, right? All looks okay. You have a 22 gauge line, you have some uh, ringolactate uh, that is going and it doesn't have any dextrose in it. 
So uh, do I need to give dextrose to all children undergoing anesthesia? If uh, uh, yes, uh, why? And if no, which all children should I give dextrose? Um, dextrose is not needed for all children. Uh, it's usually for uh, ch neonates, infants of diabetic mother, children with liver disorders, children who, are, who is in sepsis and who undergo prolonged surgery along with a regional anesthesia in whom the stress response is reduced. So those children, we target a sugar of 70 to 150. So in those patients, we give 1% dextrose added to the ringer lactate. Uh, How do you make a solution of 1% dextrose in ringer lactate? Uh, from the ringer lactate 500 ml, we remove 20 ml and add a 20 ml of 25% dextrose. So that makes it 1% dextrose. Right. So um, in this child who's had his apple juice, we may not like to give dextrose for a two-hour surgery, believing that a few hours later, he will be assumed, uh, presumed to, to uh, uh, take orally afterwards. So your surgery is going on. Your heart rate is about 110. The blood pressure is uh, about 80 by 40. Uh, saturation is 86. And just when you think, okay, can I leave the technician and have a cup of tea and come quickly, you suddenly notice that the saturation starts falling. You know, the tone comes down, 88, 82, and you, you fiddle with the pulse ox probe, hoping it'll pick up. It doesn't. And as you're looking, the saturation is coming down. It's now at 70. And the heart rate has also transiently come down to about uh, 82 from about 110. And BP is actually recording. You're not seeing the value because it takes about a minute. How would you respond to this situation and how do you manage? Uh, so it may be an intraoperative hypoxic or cyanotic smell that spell that is happening. So I immediately increase the depth of anesthesia, give an additional dose of opioid mm -hmm. and give a fluid bolus, 10 to 50 ml per kg of a uh, balance salt solution without dextrose is given. And, uh, and um, so you've given that the saturation is still there, 70, 72, 73, but it's not picked up. Surgeon is asking, should I stop? Because the blood is looking black. What are uh, you If doing? the child's previous echo shows an infundibular spasm or anything, then it so can be relieved by uh, was valvular, But I can modify it for you and say there is an infundibular stenosis. So how does that help you or does that make your management more directed? Uh, we can give a beta blocker, we can give esmolol 0.5 mg per kg or a metolol uh, 0.1 mg per kg. Uh, even then, if it is not relieved, uh, we can uh, we should try correcting the acidosis so by the giving bicarb. Saturation comes up to about 75. BP is about 68 by 30. Now, what do you do? Uh, I'll give uh, IV phenylephrine. Uh, yes, how much do you give? 0.5 mics per kg IV bolus. Okay. So uh, can you explain briefly the pathophysiology in TOF and how does Trenin help in the management of a, a TED spell? Um, so you have a VSD, right? And the VSD uh -huh. shuns from? Uh, left to left. Right. There is no forward flow of blood across the right ventricular outflow tract, correct? So, yes, how does frenin actually help? By increasing the, you said, yes. right, the goal of anesthesia was to prevent increasing the SPR. So, it increases the systemic vasculature, yes, which is why squatting or even clenching the fist or any uh, maneuver that will increase SVR may actually help in the management of a death spell. Okay, so you have given frenin and slowly and gradually the saturation comes again back to 85 and the surgeon proceeds to complete the surgery, right? He is done. And now you have to take a call on am I ready to extubate? What are the criteria? What are the things that you look for in this child to decide that if you can extubate on table? And please tell me how you would manage extubation for this child. Uh, the ch child should be hemodynamically stable, maintaining uh, normal BP and the saturation should be between 80 to 90. And the sh you should make sure uh, that the child is pain-free. So give adequate analgesia, local infiltration by the surgeons. 
and yes. there should not be any active bleeding right and normally use uh, something right for almost all patients as part of multimodal analgesia yeah so the yeah. methods of reducing pain and pain responses is to give good opioid then you mentioned that the surgeon uses a local anesthetic correct right yes, and another thing that you give as part of multimodal is iv paracetamol 15 paracetamol. mg per kg can be given. make sure that your child is quite pain free okay so you have a hemodynamically stable child maintaining good satur acceptable saturations bp is normal then when you feel that the child is actually coming off and the relaxant effect has worn off it is time for you to extubate, extubate. right uh, what are the precautions that you would take before you extubate this child um since it's an uh, dental procedure if there is any oral pack that has been kept that has to be removed prior to extubation right mm -hmm. right so and uh, yeah and suction trick to be done right right and then uh, now you have decided to extubate the child the child is awake responding to call but otherwise comfortable saturation is about 85 86 is there any particular position you would like to shift the child and what instructions would you give to the nurse in charge of the recovery area where you're going to shift the child uh i would shift the child in a lateral position uh and i'll ask the post op icu stay for around 4 to 6 hours till the child starts taking orally and uh, an oxygen supplementation should be uh, there um to maintain a saturation of 85 to 90 and um uh, make sure hydration is adequate even in the post op period right right so you mentioned uh, while you were talking about the palp auscultatory findings in the child that you were able to hear a continuous murmur in the clavicular area right and what is that due to right sided uh, for this child uh, probably due to the bitish modified bitish shunt that has been once your child is extubated and you are able to hear this sound you know that your shunt is intact yes. right and if for some reason god forbid that for whatever reasons that murmur is not heard and the child is desaturating then you know your diagnosis instantly it's a blocked right? shunt what would you do if your shunt were blocked what are the options that are available we can immediately take the child to a cath lab and try yes. to uh, right. stent the hmm so yes that is the procedure that needs to be done it hopefully it will be successful if it is not it is deep trouble right so in this context again one needs to be very careful about taking children with a palliative procedure like the bt shunt for a lap surgery where they may be subjected to prolonged increases in intra abdominal pressure and this may actually cause the stasis and a slowing of the blood flow so um uh, i think we have a little time before we move on so i just wanted to ask you in the history you had mentioned about the child not having convulsions right if this yes, child yes. at the age of 4 years with only a palliated shunt presented with a decreased sensation of consciousness and one episode of convulsion and presents to the er what are your thoughts and what how would you manage what do you um, think could happen to this child and why uh it may be any brain abscess that occurs due to the uh, why does a brain abscess occur in a child with tetralogy and what are the factors that could predispose to this abscess brain abscess um basically the pulmonary circulation is bypassed in these patients So they okay. are having the pulmonary circulation bypass, but why are they having an abscess? What happens to the hypervascularity? Yeah, so there is sludging of blood, right? So if they are, the more older they are, the greater the chances. I think the greater the chances that they are living with low oxygen causes more stasis and can predispose to an intracranial abscess, which again becomes a emergency, right? And you go through the same management plus, of course. the additional components of having an increased intracranial pressure right which i'm sure is extremely challenging so i'll just summarize before we move on to the next candidate 
So a four-year-old child with a cyanotic congenital heart disease who has not undergone a corrective surgery because of an unfavorable pulmonary anatomy and who has been palliated at one and a half years of age with a BT shunt, which is functional and is now having an acceptable saturation without having had any other embolic complications or any intracranial complications, presence for a dental extraction. Our concerns are to understand the physiology and its palliation and the fact that the treatment is adequate and appropriate for the child at all stages to ensure adequate hydration to provide infective endocarditis prophylaxis, to prevent the occurrence of an intraoperative TET spell, and to always, the goals of anesthesia being to always maintain the systemic vascular resistance and to prevent the occurrence of any of the factors that could precipitate a TET spell. Fluid management, you would err on the side of being more liberal rather than restrictive. And intraoperative management, you can titrate to the management of a TET spell if it were to occur intraoperatively. And postoperatively, you've very nicely gone through all the conditions that you look at before you extubate and manage this child. So thank you very much, Kritika. I just like the moderator to uh, probably can we take questions for this case now before we move to the second or do the second case and then go. Dr. Ira, um, I think it would be better um, to have the question so that it can summarize the whole case here just now. Yes, and we have sure. a very specific question now by uh, Muthu Kumar. And One we second. have a question that, yeah. So my students are not the only ones getting stressed. I realized I was sweating. <laughs> yeah, go on. Uh, Ma'am, the question is, how do you induce the baby when there is no IV line? So I think Muthu Kumar has joined late. Where is Muthu Kumar? Yeah. So uh, we already said at our center, the pattern is to put an IV line because most of them will have them on antibiotic proof laxes or cover when we go for surgery. Oh, you're asking me in a situation where the child does not have an IV line, is it? Um, a tricky question. So we have them. So I'm not sure what I would do. Perhaps you have an option of intramuscular ketamine or you take the child, uh, uh, you know, taking the risk of uh, a child of, uh, crying and then try a little bit of inhalation, try an IV and probably give ketamine. That would be a little messy, but I'm not sure what else I would do. Yeah, sorry, I, uh, I misunderstood, misread your question. If your child doesn't have an IV, then the options would be intramuscular ketamine, about uh, 5 mg per kg. That would probably quieten the child and have the desired effect on the SVR. If the child is absolutely unwilling, then maybe you can try a little oral midazolam and calm the child and then secure an IV. I guess uh, I haven't done too much of it, but this is what I think I would do if I were faced with the situation. With your permission, may I answer this question, ma'am? I would like to yes, add yes. that we, when we take these cases uh, for surgery, we usually have an IV. In case the IV is not in situ, then we pre-medicate them prior. You know that the child is coming for a surgery, so you pre-medicate them with either say, a finergan, uh, which is given in the morning of surgery, or you can also pre-medicate them with... Uh, you can say Dexmed or Midazolam, but it'll take time. So you should know that you have to pre-medicate your child around 45 minutes to half an hour prior to taking the child into uh, the theater. So uh, Dr. Ira, um, you probably do more cardiac than I do, but uh, 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 is Midazolam, I mean, okay for a child with a tetralogy? It doesn't cause any undesirable side. And you mentioned Dexem, and I would be probably, I, you know, Concerned when I use these two medications, which are known to have a sympathetic uh, blockade, you know, as free medication in a child where you don't want to have uh, those this thing. So I'm not sure if you use them and you're happy. Um, routinely, if you're doing it, uh, most of the cases, they do not have much of an issue. We do it around 45 minutes prior when my intranasally given does not cause much of a issue to these patients. They're calmly sedated. Uh, I've used serpfenergan regularly for these patients for over more than three years. They are also very calm and quiet when they enter in. Plus, they have a very easy IV access. So even mild sedation, we have, they have 
congested, engorged veins. So it's very easy to get in an IV access in the patients who are cyanotic congenital heart diseases. Right. Right. Uh, Dr. Ila and uh, Lakshmi, ma'am, uh, can we have all the queries at the end of the second second talk, ma'am? Sure. Sure. We'll, we can so, begin the second. So we just thought we'll uh, kind of uh, do it when, you know, people were on it. But that's fine. They can, of course, note down the questions and we can try to help them uh, at the end of surgery. Yes, so uh, it's now 7.15, right? 45 minutes. Uh, shall we move on to the second case discussion? Rachita, are you ready? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So please go on with uh, Dr. Rachita Naik. will now present the second uh, part of our presentation, which is a asynotic congenital heart disease. And she will be speaking to you about a five-year-old baby who has a VSD and is presenting for a hernia repair. So go on, Rachita, go on to your presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Um, good evening. My patient is a five-month-old child hailing from Ernakulam, accompanied by his mother, who is his informant. She says that the child is having a swelling in the right groin area for the last two weeks. A history of presenting illness, the child has a swelling in the right groin area since the last two weeks, which is insidious in onset, progressive in nature, increases on coughing and crying, and regresses on lying down. However, since the last two days, it does not always regress, and the child has increased crying since the last two days. Antenatally, the child is uh, born to a non-consanguineous marriage, is the second child, birth history. He was born at, via full-term normal vaginal delivery at 39 weeks of gestation, and cried immediately after birth with a birth weight of 2.65 kilograms. He did not require any neonatal ICU stay after delivery. However, postnatally, on the second day of life, the child was detected with a murmur and the mother was told that the child has a hole in the heart and is on con uh, constant cardiac uh, cardiology follow-up. He was advised cardiac surgery after a few months of stabilization uh, on medical management. The mother says the child is unable to suckle continuously during feeds, turns, uh, um, turns um, has an increased sweating during feeds along with slight tachypnea and that improves gradually while resting and the child goes back uh, to suckle. He however has inadequate weight gain for his uh, age and has a history of frequent respiratory tract infections which are managed conservatively uh, on antibiotic syrups. She has no history of uh, cyanosis, hospitalization, um, loss of consciousness, seizures, or developmental delay. The child um, developmentally achieved neck holding at three months and uh, immature pincer grasp at five months. Immunization is up to date according to the national immunization schedule. Uh, medication history, the child is... Uh, faces are normal. However, the child is poorly nourished and small for age. There's no evidence of pallor, um, clubbing or uh, edema. The child was examined in the mother's arms and would maintain constant, uh, would follow the examiner's uh, fingers. Um, vitals, the child was afebrile on touch, had a heart rate of 136 beats per minute, regular rhythm and was equal in all four limbs with a respiratory rate of 36 cycles per breath, abdominal thoracic type of respiration. He had a uh, pulse oximeter and SpO2 of 100% uh, at room air, which is measured in the right upper limb. The child had a um, capillary filling time of less than three seconds. Airway was grossly appeared normal. Systemic examination, CVS on inspection, the chest appears normal with a normal JVP and moves equally with respiration and had no visible pulsations. On palpation, the child had apical impulse felt in the fifth intercostal space in the left midclavicular line. No thrill was felt. On auscultation, uh, S1 was normal and S2 was split. Uh, there was a pansystolic murmur uh, of, three of three by six grading heard in the left lower sternal edge. No thrill or parasternal heave was noticed. Um, respiratory system, uh, there was bilateral normal vesicular breath sounds heard equally on both sides. However, there was mild intercostal uh, retractions and occasional fine crepitations heard. Other systems grossly appeared normal and on per abdomen examination, there was no hepatomegaly. 
IV access was also present. To summarize, my patient is a five-month-old child hailing from Ednakulam, uh, presenting with failure to thrive and diagnosed with acyanotic congenital heart disease at birth, most likely to be a ventricular septal defect, presenting for um, presenting now for an intermittently irreducible inguinal hernia, posted for an emergent open hernia, uh, hernia repair in a common status state. So you did say he had uh, fine crepitations, right? And he is on frusamide. So do you believe he is fully compensated or is he in some kind of failure? It's uh, a ma'am and the patient. Mm -hmm. Ma'am and the patient came in. Uh, he had a, he was admitted for a, a, an upper respiratory tract infection as well, and he was diagnosed with it with the hernia. And at the time, um, the child was. Um, Given IV furosemide, Why and that has now been tabled back to need an IV furosemide. Uh, you nice, very nicely presented all the details and summed it up also. So my concern is that when you're talking about fine crepitations, is he actually compensated or is he slightly decompensated? Now, uh, you at the, the time of examination. Why is a furosemide given in a child with a VSD? Um, um, a VST would have an increased pulmonary blood flow. Uh, in this child, at the time of uh, when the child was admitted, he was uh, diagnosed to have fine crepitations, and VSTs tend to have a volume overloaded state. Uh, in an attempt to diurise, uh, diuresis, uh, to cause further diuresis, IV, uh, the, the child was switched over to IV furosemide. So, uh, Kritika has spoken about the classification of cyanotic congenital heart disease. Could you tell us a little bit of acyanotic? I mean, I'm always so much happier looking at that word acyanotic. Can you please classify that for us? Um, acyanotic congenital heart diseases can occur at three levels. Uh, they can form shunts or obstructive lesions or occur at the level of the iota. When they form shunts, they form simple left to right shunts such as AST, VST or PDA. Physiologically, these, um, these conditions tend to have increased pulmonary blood flow. Obstructive lesions can occur either at the right ventricular out, um, right or left ventricular outflow tracts. If um, right ventricular outflow tract obstructions can occur uh, in the form of infantibular stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, or branch pulmonary artery stenosis, left ventricular outflow tract lesions can be subvalvular or supravalvular aortic stenosis. Both these kind of uh, obstructive tract lesions are uh, tend to be fixed cardiac output states. Uh, when the lesion occurs at the level of the iota, it can occur as a co coactation of iota and uh, present as an upper body hypertension. Right. So this child probably has a BSD and definitely has been symptomatic as documented by frequent respiratory tract infections and the need for a diuretic implant that the child has been in congestive failure at some point of time and is either fully compensated or maybe needs better uh, management. So this child probably needs a hernia surgery because the hernia showing features of becoming irreducible or incarcerated. And if it becomes an emergency, adds so much more to the morbidity and outcome, right? So you have to take this child with a VSD who is on diuretic therapy for a semi-elective management of hernia. Now, before we move on to how we manage this case, could you just brief us about the pathophysiology that happens in a VSD? Um, a ventricular septal defect uh, basically occurs in the when there is a defect present in the interventricular septal. You've also septal. shown in the picture various locations. Perhaps you can tell us the various locations and then tell us about the pathophysiology. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there are four most uh, the, there are four types of VSD. Uh, inlet VSTs, outlet VSTs, perimembranous VSTs, and muscular VSTs. When there are perimembranous VSTs, such as this child, uh, it lies in the membranous septum and is basically a continuity between the tricuspid and aortic valves. Uh, muscular VSTs tend to be um, uh, tend to be present throughout, uh, can be present in a variety of locations, but however, they tend to have a better natural progression and can close uh, more spontaneously. Uh, the other two types, which is the inlet VST, it lies in the inlet septum and it forms part of more complex atrioventricular uh, septal defects. And uh, the outlet VST or the doubly committed subarterial VST uh, is known by several other names. 
and is more common in Asian groups and is a fibrous continuity between the aortic and pulmonary valves. I think you prepared that well. Yeah. Could you tell us about the pathophysiology also? What happens to the blood flow in a VSD? Why does a child get this volume overload or pulmonary edema? And when does it happen? Yes, uh, in, um, in a VSD, there is a ventricular septal defect in the interventricular septum that causes, uh, that causes a communication between the right and the left ventricle. Uh, generally, because the uh, left ventricle has higher pressures, it tends to transmit uh, a higher volume into the right ventricle. And uh, up to a point, there is a right ventricular overload. And uh, once the, um, there is a, the right ventricle is overwhelmed, uh, we tend to see features of um, pulmonary when congestion. Is what is the proportion of pulmonary to the LV blood flow at which patient begins to manifest symptoms? Uh, 3 is to 1 is the ratio between the QPQS, which is the um, blood flow in the pulmonary uh, circulation versus the blood flow in the systemic circulation. When the, th when the blood flow in the pulmonary circulation is three times that of the uh, systemic circulation, we tend to see features of an overload uh, in the form of breathlessness, tachypnea, and um, congestive cardiac failure. So, uh, unlike an older adult who may say he has shortness of breath or cannot lie down, what were you described them while you were taking the history? What are the symptoms that, uh, or this, the, the signs or symptoms that the mother would probably tell you about a baby who's having those features, like in this child? Uh, Ma'am, children tend to present with typical suck, rest, suck cycles, which um, basically have the child suckling at the um, mother's breast for a while, but however, requires a period of rest to complete a feed. And uh, these uh, children tend to also show, uh, have signs of sweating, tachypnea during these yeah. feeds. And um, they can also present with inadequate weight gain, uh, eventually diagnosed with failure to thrive and uh, become small for, just, uh, small for weight, uh, right. for age. Right. So you have uh, this child, I think you mentioned the child's weight at 3.6, although his birth weight was about 2.6 or 2.7 kgs, right? Yes. Which definitely indicates that he is well below the 20th percentile for his age. So there is a failure to thrive. The child has needed a medication and probably is being scheduled for a surgery at uh, some date soon, but maybe before six months or just after six months. Child is likely to have a corrective cardiac uh, surgical repair. So now you've got to see this child and prepare the child for a hernia, which is being done on the non-cardiac general pediatric surgeon and a general non-cardiac anesthetist. So tell us how you would uh, see the child preoperatively, what you would tell the mother. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I think you need to tell us about the investigation before you take the child for surgery. What do you think is pertinent? What are the things you look for? And uh, what would you do before taking the child for surgery? Ma'am, after a thorough uh, clinical history and evaluation, uh, we would... Um, what blood yeah. investigations would you do? What special yeah. investigations would you do? Uh, we would require to get a complete blood count. Uh, these children tend to be anemic uh, in, in view of nutritional deficiencies. Uh, we would also require a basic coagulation profile in the form of platelets and PTINR. Um, since these children tend to have frequent upper respiratory tract infections, um, we would require a total blood, uh, a total um, WBC count uh, to ensure that we have ruled out any upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, children on uh, with BSDs tend to be prophylactically placed on uh, digoxin, uh, diuretics, or AC inhibitors. In view of these medications, especially digoxin uh, and uh, diuretics. We would require a serum electrolyte profile ma, because uh, they can tend to have hyponatremia uh, and hypocalcemia and hypokalemia with uh, diuretics such as furosemide. Um, right. The other investigations... Go on, go on. Uh, that we would require would uh, be a, a 12 lead ECG. Um, they would tend to show uh, left ventricular predominance in the lateral leads. Uh, however, uh, we primarily go by the chest X-ray and echocardiogram. The chest X-ray tends to show a, um, a cardiomegaly or a cardiac predominance along with increased uh, pulmonary plethora um, in the peripheries, uh, suggestive of increased pulmonary blood. Case, right, where you have pulmonary oligemia and top, here you have too much blood in the lungs. Right, increased pulmonary vascularity. Mm. Go on. Yes, ma'am. 
um, we would try to also get a recent echo within the last three months. Um, this child presented with a dilated uh, left atrium, tiny PFO with a left to right shunt, no MR, TR, good biventricular function, but there was a large perimembranous VST with a left to right shunt and uh, no uh, pH or left arch of coarctation. Great vessels. Okay, no AACR. Right. Essentially, the rest of it is normal. But what I would look for in any child with a large VSD would be pulmonary artery, right ventricular load and pulmonary artery pressures, right? Because yes. these children could progress to overload of the right ventricle and a volume overload in the pulmonary artery as well. Okay. So you've got this echo and you said the room air saturation was good, right? It was 99. Yes. Is that what you described? With a slight tachycardia about 130. So these are all the investigations that you have got and reviewed on the evening before surgery. And the child is scheduled for a uh, open hernia repair, um, inguinal hernia repair by the pediatric surgeon. So what would you tell the mother regarding feeding? Because all mothers worry about their child not getting enough to eat. How would you prepare? How would you prepare the OT? And uh, 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 one of my colleagues uh, has uh, pointed out that I didn't mention temperature. So I think in all pediatrics, maintenance of temperature is very crucial, which we forgot in uh, Kritika's case. Maybe you can tell us how you keep the OT ready, how you would, what you would tell the mother, how you would separate and induce anesthesia. Go on. Yes, uh, on the day prior to surgery, we visit the child and the bystander, in this case, the mother. Um, we would uh, inform her that uh, we require the child to be uh, nil by mouth or nil per oral four hours prior to procedure. That is uh, from typically in our institute at 8 a.m. So uh, up to 4 a.m. she can continue giving the child feeds. Um, we generally tend to secure an IV access. And hence we can... or this child is on exclusive breastfeeding, ma'am. This child is exclusively breastfeeding. Okay. What about any clear liquids? Uh, Ma'am, because he's five months, the mother has not started weaning yet. No, but uh, the child may drink water, right? The child doesn't only have breast milk when he's thirsty. Right? So if the child, I'm sure, drinks water, right? Besides uh, being breastfed. So if the child takes water, the mother can give in whatever, either in a bottle or a spoon or whatever she can give. Right? Mm -hmm. Until two hours before she can give the child. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go on. What about uh, your medical separation from the mother? Are you concerned about stranger anxiety? How is your um, OT prepared to handle this child? What is your plan for anesthesia? Ma'am, um, to prepare the OT, I would turn off the uh, AC and while, your, before induction. Uh, we would keep an uh, ambient uh, uh, warmer uh, as well as a bear hugger ready on the table. Uh, we would have a convection uh, warm heater um, overhead the OT table. Um, we also tend to keep uh, emergency drug trays uh, and IV induction agents along with an emergency ampoule resuscitation uh, set with us while uh, inducing the while pre medicating the child at the uh, before wheeling into the OT theater. Are you going to send so five child? Does this child have an IV line? Uh, Ma'am, this child has an IV access, but because uh, I don't anticipate stranger anxiety in a child less than six to seven months, uh, if this child is cooperative, uh, we would take him in as is. But if the child is uncooperative or irritable, uh, we would consider giving IV ketamine, 1 mg per kg, in this case 3.5 uh, mg, uh, along with glycopyrrolate at 0 0.02 mg IV, uh, and then take the child into the OT theater. So there is also an option for oral pre-medication, right? As was discussed by the other moderator. Yes. In centers that are used to giving, you probably have an array of oral pre-medicants as well. And whichever they are comfortable and have experience with can be used safely, right? Okay. So let's say this child was cooperative and you take this baby inside. What's your plan for anesthesia? Uh, Ma'am, our plan for anesthesia would be general anesthesia with an oral endotracheal tube and intermittent positive pressure ventilation along with caudal analgesia and an additional IV access. Um, the anesthetic uh, goals would be to maintain LV contractility, maintain adequate preload and heart rate, maintain a PVR because a drop in PR, PVR would worsen the uh, left to right shunt, avoid uh, a volume overload, 
and maintain norm uh, normoxia, normocarbia, or mild hypercarbia to prevent uh, pulmonary vasodilatation and maintain a normal to low SCR. So, how would you achieve all this? How would your let's you got off without having to give any pre medicin? The child has come with you to the OR. Now, how are you going to induce the child? Would it be IV? Would it be inhalational? And if whatever your answer is, can you justify your answer? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, because uh, VST tends to have increased pulmonary blood flow uh, and increased, um, we can achieve a faster induction with inhalational induction uh, with inhalational induction with sevoflurane. Um, however, I would like to um, we um, but too much of sevoflurane in children with VST could tend to cause myocardial depression. So, uh, in order to pr provide a deep enough plane of anesthesia without uh, suppressing the myocardium. Uh, it would. I would uh, consider supplementing with. Um, I would also like uh, give an IV um, induction at uh, IV glycopyrrolate at uh, five mics per kg at zero point uh, zero two mg IV, followed by IV ketamine one to one point five mg per kg in titrated boluses, uh, supplemented with IV midazolam at uh, zero point zero three mg per kg, and um, after the child is under. I would uh, uh, induce with, uh, I would uh, provide an unchecked bag, uh, mask ventilation. I would give IV cisatracurium 0.15 mg per kg dose, uh, which comes up to 0.5 mg IV. Uh, we would uh, then secure the tube with, with an oral endotracheal tube uh, between the sizes of 3.5 to 4 mm, uh, whichever provides a snug fit. And uh, I would take an uncuffed tube, uh, check for leak in the flexed neck position and uh, fix at an uh, angle of mouth uh, somewhere between 10 to 11 centimeters. Uh, and would, uh, you then... avoided opioid and I don't quite disagree with you, but is there any particular reason or did you just forget to say something? Uh, Ma'am, I plan to uh, supplement with the regional anesthetic technique. Uh, hence, I preferred a low opioid strategy uh, in this case. Um, my plan for uh, analgesia would be a, a caudal analgesia. So after inducing the child, I would try. Uh, I would make the child uh, lie in lateral position and under sterile uh, precautions, um, using the landmark technique between the two posterior superior leg spines, uh, approach the sacral hiatus, and um, give a dose of one ml per kg of 0.2 percent uh, ropivacaine which in this case would be 3.6 ml of 0.2% Um, uh, And yes, ma'am. Hence, I avoided uh, um, opioids, ma'am. Right. So somebody has put in the chat box, what about IE prophylaxis? So have we forgotten or would you have given? What, what are your thoughts on giving IE prophylaxis? We have to give for a TOF. Do you have to give for a VSD? Mm, no, ma'am. Ma hmm? No? Yeah. So I'm not okay. sure at one point in time they were not uh, this thing, but yes, in a child who has a flow across a VSD at high pressures, you would maybe like to give a uh, 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 infective undercarriage prophylaxis. Anyway, the surgical team is giving an antibiotic, so most of the time there is a cover. If there wasn't, I still would believe that I would like to give an IE prophylaxis, right? Okay. So you've taken care of induction, you've taken care of uh, uh, intubation, you've taken care of analgesia with a caudal, right? Now, please tell me uh, the fluid management for this child. How, would, um, how much fluid would you give for a, uh, how much was the weight? 3.6 3. kgs. 3.6 kgs. What fluids? Uh, Ma'am, we would give about 12 ml per kg of uh, IV um, balanced salt solutions such as Ringer's lactate. Uh, because this child could be um, fasting for a slightly longer period after the surgery as well, we could consider adding 1% dextrose. Um, the um, fluid strategy would not be uh, liberal nor restrictive. Why, just be bring the lactate? Why not isolate P? Because isolate P is a very, when people see the P in isolate P, they think it's pediatric. So is isolate P good? Are there any drawbacks with it? They have a high potassium. High potassium. What about the dextrose and ice light P? It's a 5% dextrose and sodium is very low. 
and one of the things that um, uh, was seen when you had children being given half normal saline was hyponatremia associated convulsions which is why we give a bath salt solution strictly speaking the sodium content in ringa lactate is how much 151 which is again slightly less than a normal plasma of 140 but we find that acceptable and balanced solution because it contains lactate which gets converted to bicarbonate if you were to give half normal saline there is no base in that okay so you would give ringa lactates i agree with you regarding your decision to give dextrose it can be this way or that way if you believe that this child could take a longer while before oral feeds were re established then perhaps i'd like to give a one person dextrose so that till the child takes orally this child is covered okay mm. uh, now this surgery is over surgery for hernia barely takes 30 minutes you have not given opioid your cordal has acted very well heart rate is about 96 bp is about uh, 75 by 35 saturation is 100 at 50% fio2 when do you decide to extubate the child what are the uh, checklists that you look at before you decide to extubate a child uh mama we uh, the child is hemodynamically stable uh, if we have adequate spo uh, is being maintained the equivalent of uh, the adult uh, head uh, head lift is uh, hip flexion in pediatric uh, age group so if the child is uh, having adequate uh, hip flexion uh, and is awake and we've given adequate time since the last uh, muscle relaxant was given we can consider reversal uh, with 0.2 mg of uh, neostigmine iv for, uh, along with uh, glycopyrrolate at 10 mg per kg uh, for this child surgery uh, was over your cordal was acting you managed fluid appropriately the lungs were clear right and you decide to extubate the child because after all you looked at everything which your madam has told you to look at so you've used a, a four size tube and uh, you extubate the child and initially all seems to be good but then you slowly notice that there is a seesaw movement of the abdomen and the chest and the saturation starts to fall and as the child is breathing you are now listening to a kind of an inspiratory crowing noise as a child is breathing what's your diagnosis and how do you manage what do you call this condition how do you manage i am most likely to have a laryngospasm uh, because of extubation and inadequate plane uh, i was trying to pass either how do you manage um ma'am we would hold a bag ma uh, we would mask ventilate the child and provide positive pressure ventilation in order to break the spasm in okay. uh, in the event that we are not able to break it with uh, with an uh, with increasing the apl valve we can uh, start increasing the depth of uh, anesthesia with an inhalation of sevoflurane uh, and continue to pro provide positive pressure ventilation uh, in the event that that is inadequate to break the spasm we can deepen the plane of anesthesia further by supplementing by with uh, propofol at about uh, 0.5 mg per kg uh, and uh, still doesn't respond you tried all that and sats are now you know even the monitor is just not even showing a number the spo2 is just showing a trace and no number and i'm uh, sure you um, would expect it be there what do you do as a last resort as life saving uh, saxamethonium no 0.5 mg per kg 0.5 mg per kg can be given to break the spasm although the spasm in very small children is easy to break it becomes more difficult the more muscular the person is right what are your concerns if the child has been kind of breathing against a closed gut glottis and generating negative pressure for a long time maybe not uh, for a 3 kg child but little older children uh, with more what muscular uh, uh, chest walls we tend to uh, see um, frequencies of negative pressure pulmonary uh, pulmonary edema and uh, in a child with bst uh, having such a case would make uh, make the child prone to pulmonary uh, will will be um, the child will tend to have a pulmonary edema more easily uh, so we would consider okay, diuresis with iv furosemide with right. iv furosemide okay so i think uh, your case was also very beautifully presented a 5 month old 3.6 kg uh, infant with a failure to thrive having been diagnosed with an asynotic congenital heart disease being managed medically until a corrective surgery is planned a few weeks later has presented for the management of a recurrent uh, uh, in not recurrent meaning uh, 
uh, inguinal hernia that is showing signs of irreducibility for elective management before any complication. So you have said that your concerns about the decongestive measures for the child being continued. I would believe IE prophylaxis needs to be maintained and you manage fluids without causing an overload. And your goals in anesthesia, you prevent pulmonary vasodilatation and hyperoxia. So you keep your oxygen at a minimum level that is needed to maintain the saturations above 95. You don't have to give very high FiO2s. And the rest of it is whatever you said, appropriate fluid, maintaining a normal to low SVR, preventing extreme tachycardia, right? And uh, the rest of it, you, uh, the canomocabia, et cetera, is absolutely right. So you manage and make sure that you your child's airway is maintained appropriately at the end of surgery. So thank you very much, uh, Rajita and Prithika, for taking up this um, uh, presentation. I think both of you did very well. And I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions from the audience and maybe Dr. Ira can clarify or add on to whatever I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. That was an excellent case presentation, both the candidates. Uh, now we have good 15 minutes. We can have wonderful discussions. May I request Dr. Ira to take up the questions? for the speakers and the uh, chairperson. Sure. So I think we'll first uh, take questions from Tetralogy of Fellow, which was the first case, ma'am, is that okay? Sure, sure, anything. Yeah, okay. So we just started off and we ended in between. That question remains still there. If a patient does not have a IV access, I do not want since it's a PG class to be confused and answer something which is not acceptable by the uh, examiners as well. So your first answer always should be that you would like to acquire an IV access prior to taking the child in, inside the theater because IV access, uh, IV induction is faster in a patient with tetralogy, although inhalational can also be done, but it will take time till that child will be cranky and chances of going into spells will be high. So we'll prefer an IV induction. You can also prepare an IV prior 45 minutes by applying AMLA cream. So these are the options which we have. Or else you can say oral pre-medications can be tried. Any doubts in that or in case somebody disagrees can ask. That's okay. One question, question is what to be yeah. done in cat lab uh, stent is blob. If you have a blob shunt or something else. What do we done? Uh, yeah, you actually try and recanalize uh, the sh shunt, and it has been done at our institute, uh, which is why we answered this way. Uh, I'm not sure about the technical details of what French catheter goes and how they open the stent, but they do open it. They do open it. There may be a, a requirement of heparinization to keep the stent patent, and the child, of course, has to be on antiplatelets to ensure that it doesn't get blocked. But these are problems. This is a problem that has happened for us in an eight year old child who was palliated and who underwent a laparoscopic nephrectomy. And we realized at that time the pressure was causing a lot of backflow and the stasis within the shunt. And lo and behold, at the end of three and a half hours, this uh, shunt was actually blocked. And that was catastrophic. We did manage to revive the child, but I think it happened because our center is very well equipped to handle this kind of emergency. So uh, yes, it can be. And now that we know that this can happen, this is just uh, kind of letting you all know about uh, critical incidents, which can be prevented if we were aware of it. I think for tetralogy, there are no more questions. Uh, for VS just, uh, just one more question. Can uh, any other drug be used if ketamine is not available for induction of anesthesia? For which uh, patient? For tetralogy? Uh, uh, we haven't really thought of a situation when... I don't know. You can use perhaps a little of uh, um, any IV agent and supplement with phenylephrine because your goal is you don't want the SVR to go down, right? So the drug should not cause uh, uh, a myocardial depression. And then, of course, the SVR. So you can balance it by giving a drug that will increase the SVR. And probably that's what we would do. I hope that's answered the questions from the person who asked. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Dr. Ira, can we move on to the second case? Uh, for this? 
Yeah, definitely. We can go for other queries which are there for VST. Is there any change in anesthesia management with respect to the size of the VST and how to grade the VST? Uh, um, so basically, uh, grading the size of the VST would be reflected by the magnitude of shunt, which in turn is reflected by the pulmonary blood flow. Right. So when you find so these, the more the shunt is, the more sick the child is going to be, the more the failure to thrive and the more the need for decongestant therapy and after load reduction. So uh, I guess we would just look at the child and know which one is quite sick and which one is not. So as she had said, the muscular VSDs are small. You get the malady V. Roger and they're not actually going to give any trouble because they're small VSDs. Regarding how we would uh, gauge uh, the severity is, of course, looking at the amount of right ventricular volume uh, overload and the coexistence of any pulmonary artery hypertension. So I'm not able to see your question. I'm kind of following whatever Ira is saying. So uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, this question is actually asked by Laksh SM at 7.39 p.m. <laughs> 7.39, okay. 7.39, that's quite up on this. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, so we are grading it like based on mild, moderate and uh, a severe VST. So small, moderate size or a large VST by the sizing also if it's less than 5, 5 to 10 or more than 10. What is important is that if it is small or moderate up to less than 10, it's not much of a worry and will have less hemodynamic uh, changes as compared to a large VST, which will be more than uh, 10 mm in size, that is like more than one centimeter in size, which will be associated with pulmonary artery hypertension and left uh, ventricular overload. And in these patients, only your induction uh, where SVR and PVR will play a greater role. And you have to take care of all the factors which affect these. And also probably induction with the 50% of oxygenation will help these large VST patients compared to the other two. All right, Mamsa, we have another one more question. Uh, does VSD warrant ET tube? Can we use LMA Pro Seal, especially in view of Krebs? Yeah, so uh, that's a question which I actually asked my PG also. What would you do? Would you like to put it? See, because in children, you want to keep them spontaneously breathing. Can you use an LMA? And so the answer, which I feel would be appropriate, at least in the PG point of view, is you don't want them to have spontaneous breathing because it does increase the work of breathing. The inhalation agent that is necessary to maintain that depth of anesthesia can cause a myocardial depression, which is undesirable. So you would want to uh, ventilate the child. Now, whether you want to ventilate with a pro seal or an endotracheal tube is a matter of choice uh, because we don't do use the supraglottic airways so regularly. I'm happy to put a tube and do a controlled ventilation. So if you are somebody who uses supraglottic airways very comfortably, happy with positioning, maintaining the adequate plane, I think perhaps assisted ventilation or using a neuromuscular blocking agent, allowing controlled ventilation to reduce work of breathing would be something worthwhile. But I guess you could use one or the other as long as the hernia is not obstructed. If the hernia is obstructed and the child has some degree of ileus, then hmm, obviously you would want an endotracheal tube. Or if you are so stubborn to use the supraglottic airway, just make sure you pass the you know, the suction catheter into the stomach so that the stomach contents are constantly being deflated. I think once we know that there is obstruction, most of us would go for a tube and some of us might even want a cuff tube. Thank you, Amson. Uh, next we have, uh, can we give caudal for tetralogy of fallow and should we check coagulation profile? Yeah, so that's something which um, we also had concerns, right, several, several years ago. And we found out that these children are definitely not coagulopathic. And giving a caudal for appropriate surgeries definitely reduces any stress response, which in turn can uh, precipitate a spell in those children who are predisposed to it. So please go ahead. I think uh, if your INR is high, it's worthwhile getting it done again. Please do not go to give FFP uh, to a child who's not having any signs of bleeding. Regarding your decision to caudal if the INR were 1.7, it is again individualized. I might do it, but then I can't tell everybody to do it because I am doing it. 
So I believe it's okay because perhaps I believe I have the technique to be reasonably atraumatic and haven't had complications. So get a corrected INR. If your corrected INR is less than 1.5, go ahead and give that caudal for the required surgery. If it is more than 1.5, it's probably safe to follow the guidelines and avoid. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Next is, uh, is pre-medication necessary for a child less than six months? I think Rachita answered that question very well. She believed that uh, the stranger anxiety doesn't exist. And uh, most of the times we do get by without pre-medication. Maintenance inhalation, isofluorine can be used? I guess it can. It can be used. And uh, we just switched over to SIBO and I really haven't found too much differences using one versus the other. And SIBO is a little better in terms of acceptability and coming off. So we still use. And then the airway irritability, which technically can occur with isofluorine, is always there. So when we have SIBO, we prefer to use it for children. One question. Goals of extubation and post-op management, PICU observation. For which child? I think this is for uh, BSD. Right. So VSD, uh, as I said, once you manage the fluid, uh, it's quite uh, comfortable unless you have the post-extubation strider. So the child can be maintained in the ICU until fully awake. It's a small child, so allow the mother to be with the child as soon as possible. And hernia, maybe a couple of hours later, the child can go to the room if there is no evidence of decompensation. Is yes. avoided opioids making the recovery even faster. And uh, the use of caudal has really uh, cut down other anesthetic agents. So child can be allowed to feed maybe uh, two to three hours after procedure and then shift. It. Is four to one rule followed for fluid management? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, people, the hardcore pediatricians raise their eyebrows when I make that statement. But I've used it time and again, and I feel it's okay. Even when the pediatricians prescribe their fluid as so many ml per kg per 24 hours, it comes to the same thing. So I have done extensive studies in pediatrics and I have this rule of giving four to one as the basic metabolic requirement of fluids and any other ongoing losses are replaced with whatever volume you think is appropriate or plain drink the lactate and it has worked very well for me. So I believe just as a practice to avoid fluid overloading the patients, you can stick to it. And then of course, there is your judgment on the ongoing losses due to bowel exposure or surgical exposure or due to losses from the patient, which you can replace by whatever, 5 ml, 10 ml per kg of non-dextrose containing fluid. The 4 to 1 we stick to for the 1% dextrose. And uh, next is, can we advise against laparoscopic surgery in tetralogy of fellow exclusion criteria? Uh, actually, um, uh, it's not a, um, a characteristic exclusion. So it depends on what the laparoscopy is for. So uh, these days we don't find the situation because even uh, the case that we presented is very rare. Most of the TOFs get corrected uh, very soon, maybe uh, as early as uh, two months, three months or older. They're all corrected. You don't find the uncorrected TOFs. So you either find adult congenitals or these kind of children for whom the pulmonary artery is low. So the group is very low. Okay, now coming to a child with TOF who's had palliated and you want lap surgery, now, I presume he's had some palliation because we're talking about a four, five, six-year-old child. Uh, I think one needs to be very cautious and avoid unless, um, you know, the benefits are so very overwhelming and then you do it with due precautions. Otherwise, if the child has a BT shunt, so the problem is only if the child has a BT shunt. If it is a pink toff where the left or right ventricular outflow obstruction is just moderate, the child is managing without any palliation, I think it's okay. You can do a TOF, uh, a lap surgery in a TOF. If there is a shunt, then I think the contraindication comes in. Is that, uh, Anju, is that okay? I hope it is. Uh, please elaborate about uh, CNS and renal complications having tetralogy of fellow in such a small age group, five months. So uh, the abscess only occurs when the child is over two, has a significant hyperviscosity, right? And has not had a correction. So we don't have five months coming with cerebral abscesses. The abscesses occur when they are older, definitely older than two. And the older they grow, like a four-year-old or five-year-old will have an abscess. 
Uh, I'm not sure about renal complications. If you're talking about embolic complications, very honestly, I haven't seen many of them. Can dexmedetomidine be used? I'm not sure for what procedure are they asking and uh, for which case, uh, probably for VS. Right. Like you said, I'm sure there are cardiac centers. I know my own cardiac colleagues who use dexmedetomidin. So I'm sure it can be used once you know the effects that it has and whatever the effects are acceptable to your basic pathophysiology. Like you don't want your SVR dropping. You don't want undue bradycardia. If you're able to avoid those, yeah, why not? Is it okay to continue antiplatelets in palliated child? You must continue antiplatelet uh, 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 medication in any child for whom the prescription for it has is justified. Like, for example, a small shunt. You definitely need to continue the antiplatelet. And dental surgeons and urologists are the ones who don't like aspirin. Otherwise, you should, if given the choice, give it to every child who is taking because it doesn't affect our surgery. I can give a caudal on aspirin. I can give a spinal with aspirin. So why stop it? Next is for pre-op evaluation, probably for VST. We've discussed the pre-op evaluation. The for pre -op both has been very nicely uh, presented by both the uh, speakers. Uh, the essential thing is to find out when it was diagnosed, what the palliation was done, look at all the investigations that they have in hand, repeat if you think it is less than the appropriate time that you're comfortable, then look at signs and symptoms, ECG, X-ray, and of course, the echo. And there we are. We really don't need too much more. And of course, a good pediatric cardiology team to guide you with your decisions on a case-to-case -case basis. What percentage of dextrose to be used? So again, you don't need to use it for all the patients. It is very selective. We use it only when we think that the child is shifted uh, to a recovery and nobody will be bothered about feeding and it's a long time. So uh, we use one person that is prepared by taking 20 ml out from a 500 ml of Ringer lactate and adding 20 ml of 25% dextrose to it. So if you work it out, it comes to a one person solution. And this is courtesy of none other than Dr. Rebecca Jacob, who has published it in a book years and years ago. All of us still use it till today. Okay, so ma'am, for dental extraction, plan was to put nasal intubation, but antiplatelets was asked to continue to maintain the shunt. Is this okay? Very much okay, and these are my reasons. I agree that uh, you might have a, this thing, but I'm happier to have a working BT shunt than a nasal bleed. Is etracurium okay for controlled ventilation? Yes, very much. We've just uh, got a little uh, smug with having cis atracurium. So it's more novel. It's like driving the latest brand of cars. Yes, you can. But remember, atracurium occasionally can cause a histamine release and uh, asthma. So if you want to be ultra safe and you have the availability cis atrac, if not, why not? Atracurium can be used. Is there any role of IM glyco in dental case? Uh, we prefer to use IV. So I really don't like IV. I think that ends the questions. Thank you so much. I had a long session. Perhaps we can wind up and I'm really happy to address any other questions. They can WhatsApp me or if there's a group, you can please put your questions. I'd be happy to answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sri and Dr. Nai for your wonderful case presentations. And Professor Lakshmi, ma'am, you are outstanding. You have so patiently responded to all the queries. The attendance has been amazing, cross 230 plus. That itself says the quality of the presentations and the quality of uh, moderation by you, ma'am. And thank you, Dr. Ira, a wonderful moderation by you as well. May I now request uh, Professor Bajwa, sir, to kindly uh, distribute the certificates to our speakers, Professor Lakshmi, ma'am, and Dr. Ira Dhawan. Thank you, Ankar. But I think we the house is still open for suggestions and uh, discussion. The questions have been asked in the chat box only. There are people, Dr. Madhuri is raising and there are other people also. Let them ask. Oh, yeah, yes, These students yes, cannot come for examination every day. Today, their exam is there. Yes, Dr. Madhuri. Yeah. 
good evening good evening sir good evening ma'am good evening everybody that thank you for that excellent presentation you have covered almost everything but just to ask um, regarding the grades of vsd i think somebody was asking and madam has already elaborated on that uh, so just to simplify things if it is a mild ventricular uh, it's a small vsd then there will be no signs and symptoms and if it is a larger vsd then there will be signs of left and right ventricular enlargement on the ecg right dr kritika and yes. ruchika right yes ma'am yeah and one more thing which i uh, you said that inhalational induction is you said it is hastened in patients with left to right congenital shunt right for the baby with vst you said that yes, the inhalational induction is faster yes ma'am if i'm not wrong you said that do yes, you continue with that statement or you want to change it patient with left to right congenital yeah kritika oh this is question to the pg okay. yeah yes to the pg see in a patient with left to right shunt what happens the pulmonary blood flow increases right so yes, the yes, uptake should increase or decrease it should increase but it does not change in a patient with left to right shunt that is mentioned everywhere and why it does not change is because the recirculation through the lungs of the left to right shunt blood which already carries a high concentration of anesthetic reduces the anesthetic uptake from the alveoli and this promotes a more uh, faster rise in the alveolar partial pressure so even if the pulmonary blood flow is increased what happens delaying the rise in this delays the rise in the alveolar anesthetic levels so though there is a left to right shunt it though it increases the pulmonary blood flow it does not increase the rate of anesthetic induction much okay okay thank you ma'am and uh, what are the indications for infective endocarditis prophylaxis in a child with congenital heart disease in general uh, don't worry about whether it is cyanotic or non cyanotic any child with congenital heart disease what would be your indications for giving infective endocarditis prophylaxis uh that has not been corrected and those uh, repaired within the last 6 months and mm -hmm. those who have undergone a surgery and has a residual uh, defect mm -hmm. um those you have to give it for the previous history of infective endocarditis and no, prosthetic no no, no 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 there are only very the most important indications are when there is an unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease including those with palliative shunts okay and then when you have got a completely repaired congenital heart disease with prosthetic material or device and repaired congenital heart disease with residual defects at the site and cardiac transplant recipients these are the indications for giving infective endocarditis prophylaxis yes okay yes ma'am yeah, yes, ma yeah. and what monitoring will you use monitors um so the vsd vsd case for hernia yes ma'am uh ecg uh, uh pulse oximetry probe uh, mm -hmm. temperature probe uh, mm -hmm. we generally place it uh, orally and yeah. uh, along with a age appropriate uh, weight appropriate uh, bp cuff yeah non invasive and the end tidal carbon uh, dioxide monitoring end tidal carbon dioxide and uh, precordial stethoscope if you have and an inspired oxygen concentration monitor and what about invasive arterial and all uh, ma'am uh, maybe not for a hernia case ma'am uh, okay. but if the child had major okay. fluid shifts or right. abdominal surgery yeah yeah you will you will weigh the benefit against the risk okay thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you now now the two commandos you have to answer one question the only one question i will ask it's a very practical thing uh, your case of uh, tough coming for dental extraction yes sir on that table you evaluate that patient somehow the patient has scissors and accidentally found to have a brain abscess also so what is the line of management now because you know sometimes 
you, you, patient is coming from the periphery, the dental surgeon is evaluating the patient, his examination or examination limited to the teeth only. Somehow the abscess, you know, the continuous pathway is there. It's a brain abscess or it's a middle ear infection or continuing to the brain or somewhere. If that patient has scissor on the table and it is found to have a brain abscess, now what is your take? This exam, a question, if you can answer, na, uh, again, you will get a gold medal, I'm telling you. Don't, don't ask your ma'am here. You have to answer yourself. Bring your brain into the view. Um, so we'll have to secure the array and consider intubation with uh, induction with ketamine to maintain SVR patient along with scissor, Patient had scissor on the table. Sir. But a lower dose along with uh, thiopentone, sir, to provide uh, better neuroprotection and uh, decrease CMRO2. What else you can think of? He is giving you a very big hint. What else you can think of? Operating the brain abscess. <laughs> without yeah. preparation, without evaluation, whether the abscess is cold or hot. Patient is on dental chair. Gold medal, you have to answer the answer. Yes. You have to answer the teacher. You have to answer the panel. You have to answer the teacher. You have to answer the teacher. You have to answer Bajwa, you can give one more hint. I think that will be good for them. <laughs> Has the surgeon done anything? Not Bajwa? No, I'm asking. The table is also scissored. That's what I'm telling you. The table is scissored. Dental extraction. See, dental extraction is not an emergency. Dental extraction is not an emergency. See, dental extraction is not an emergency. Got it? That is the first thing. Now the patient has come with the scissors. Whether it's because of brain abscess or not, you have to postpone this surgery. The TOF is also important. And then this one, uh, brain abscess is also important. So you have to evaluate this patient, take the patient out if you have not given anesthesia. I think uh, there are two aspects. One, before giving anesthesia, the scissors, or after giving anesthesia, the scissors. Because sometimes during anesthesia, also the scissors can occur. After that, when the patient goes deep into the plane, you will not be able to elicit the scissors. And this is a... I think common finding in many of the patients with the dental extraction, they are having presenting with the brain abscess also. So, always better to take this patient out for the time being. We will evaluate it again. Dental extraction is not an emergency. This is a, If you give this answer, then further management, I can give you two gold medals. But I think this is the first part. Take the patient out from the dental chair. Because dental chair, you will never be able to secure the airway in a proper manner. Yes. Try to take the patient out as soon as possible from the dental chair. Or you can call Lakshmi Madam also. Kindly help in this case. Ma'am, your take now. Yeah. Uh, our dental chair is not a chair. They'll come to the table. Yeah, but I completely agree with you that the dental extraction definitely takes a low priority and needs better evaluation preparation for drainage of the abscess as early as possible. Anybody else? Don't mean you want to say something. Ma'am, it was an uh, excellent moderation, and uh, we enjoyed it. And I think uh, I personally feel, uh, with the clinical experience, uh, that VSD is, I think, the safest anomaly uh, which, which we encounter. Though we have to be cautious, but I hope you will agree with me that uh, if a patient with VSD comes for any particular surgery, uh, we have to be just follow the simple rules and it comes under the category of a very safe cardiac anomaly. Your opinion on that, Madam, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, Madam? Yeah. Um, like I said, I work in an institute where they don't let any of these anomalies, they correct them very soon. So we don't get to see them. I, I do know that there are VSDs with very large shunts that go into chest infection, remain on a ventilator, so they can be challenging, very small, 1.5, 2 kg children on ventilator with a large VSD, continuous thing, and then they come with a hernia. So those, I believe, are challenging. But uh, once they have actually um, gone past and grown 
through um, infancy and still have a VSD, I believe more or less it's not very large or not very symptomatic, then it's okay. Uh, I guess it's definitely better than TOF, which is uncorrected. Definitely. Anybody want to say something or want to suggest so that we can close this session here? Okay. Uh, let us felicitate our Ma'am, this is your certificate for participation as a moderator, as one of the leading lights for the students, ma'am. This is a, from our ISA headquarters. Thank you. Thank you. Rutika, you are one. Thank you, sir. And Rachita, fine. So these certificates are actually your past certificate, if you ask me honestly, <laughs> because the way you have answered, you will definitely pass in the examination also with flying colors. And Thank Dr. You, Ira, you are also not left behind. I forgot to bring uh, at least today this Arun, uh, this Anankur certificate. So your certificate is there. I will be mailing you these certificates individually from the official mail. Okay. So by smelling, spelling needs to be corrected in this one also. Madam, you are ma'am. Actually, because uh, that's why I told you earlier also, uh, in the message, you didn't see my message in the group. I put the, check the spelling. Everybody has to check the spelling of their own. Right. Now it's corrected and the new flyer, it is corrected. Dr. Madhuri, you want to say something? Yeah, if you permit me, this was regarding your gold medal question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding the, regarding the seizures for the patient with tetralogy of fallot in the dental chair, so instead of brain abscess, could it be a thromboembolic stroke? It can be anything, but I'm telling you the diagnosis later on came out to be a brain abscess, maybe a cold brain abscess, but the scissor in a child coming for a surgery can be of many reasons, not just one reason. So mm -hmm. evaluate, you have see, scissor control is not that difficult in a child, in a young child, but the brain abscess is larger, then definitely those scissors become refractory sometime and also depends it's the first time, first time scissor or there was a history of scissor earlier on. If it's a first time scissor, I think it's easier to control. The, the recurrent scissor sometimes very difficult to control. They become refracted to the treatment in the children, especially with the brain abscess. We have seen the kids coming to the, with the brain abscess and they're getting the brain damage. Neural damage is definitely occurs after the continuous scissors or refractory scissor. So scissor control is, should be on the table, shift the patient from the dental chair to the safer table, or you can always ask. So it's always necessary whenever we are working in an institution, we are giving anesthesia on a dental chair. We should have always a facility to revive the patient immediately if any cardiac arrest occurs or if any eventuality occurs on the dental chair. Those facilities should always be given when the, we are going to administer the general anesthesia. Now there are different dental chairs which are provisioned with a, a very good, you know, lying down flat surface also. They are coming with a, some modification. But still, I think in a resource limited nation, we can have a table also when we are giving majority of the cases in our institute or dental are done in our main OTs, whatever, rather than the dental chair. So there's a little discomforting for the surgeon, but I think they are more safer. So that is what is my take on these type of patients. You should have facilities to revive these patients when you are giving GA on the chair or even the local also, when you are giving local, be prepared for GA also and airway management also in these cases. Here in Dr. Bhajwa, I like to add on if if they are doing it under local anesthesia, uh, not for this particular case. Majority of the time, uh, the cause may be absorption of the local anesthetic, or uh, and leading on to the toxicity also. But yes, definitely tough with brain abscess. Brain abscess takes the priority. Angur, you can close the session if you ask the suggestion from anybody. We can close the session. Uh, I think we are past time. Still, if there are any queries, kindly unmute and please ask the query. Else, we would close the session from the poem with the permissions of the moderator and the speakers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. It was a privilege to hear you. And uh, I think very soon, another three days, we will be hearing you again. And uh, to all the commandos, Madam K commandos, 
You I think one of them is on right? duty, sir. She's had to go away. So, Kritika's. <laughs> okay. Anyway, ma'am, this is a part and parcel of our postgraduate curriculum also. Anyway, they Thank had done you. a wonderful job and the confidence was good. And the best part was they did not make any blunder. Rather, if they were not knowing the facts, they did not go to the extreme of making a blunder. That's the way how to appear in the examination also. Thank you. Both of the commandos, you have done a wonderful job. And thank you, Ankur, very much. And Ira, you were wonderful. It was your first appearance on the national scene. I know you will be making wonders again when you come next time also. Thank you very much. And thank you to all Dr. Madhuri, Dr. Naveen, and all the senior people who are attending this class. Uh, next class, we will be having on scoliosis. I think that's a very major class because every time we see a case of scoliosis, we come up with so many challenges. The anesthesia challenges and the pulmonary tissues getting compromised and so many surgical challenges are there. So next week we will be dealing with the uh, long case of scoliosis. Till then, uh, I want to say thank you everyone again. Thank you, sir. Right. Jai ISA, long live ISA and Jai Hind.